I'm Dr. David Kirtley, CEO of Helion Energy. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the work that I presented at this year's American Physics Society Department of Plasma Physics Conference, titled Fundamental Scaling of Adiabatic Compression, Field Reverse Configuration, Thermonuclear Plasmas. Quick overview on what Helion's technology is. We take field reverse configuration plasmas, accelerate them to supersonic velocities, and merge them in a central compression region. They're then compressed to thermonuclear fusion conditions. This is a pulse system, reparated, that happens repeatedly. Fusion, exhaust the fuel, puff in new uh, fusion fuel, pre-ionize, form a field reverse configuration, accelerate them, collide them at supersonic velocities. We then super compress them up to full thermonuclear conditions um, over 100 million degrees Celsius. We've done everything right. We then can recapture that energy directly inductively um, to provide electricity for the grid. Quick overview on our technology, and then we're going to dive into some fundamental scaling relations of field reverse configurations, how we heat them, how we compress them, and how we model them. So Trenta's, uh, Helion's sixth prototype was called Trenta. Uh, Trenta, we ran through 2020, 2021, um, and are still collecting data today on this system. Um, in Trenta, this is around a 10 megajoule peak compression. Uh, we demonstrated that we could heat deuterium fusion ions up to over 9 keV temperature, um, as well as perhaps even more importantly, electrons well over 1 keV ele electron temperature. And then we took this, to this machine and we ran it over 10,000 shots. Um, showing that we can do this repetitively and get reproducible results. We have a lot of references here. If you want to learn more about what Helion has done, both on the physics, the engineering, as well as regulatory um, and safety cases for fusion, as well as Helion's specific approach to fusion. So let's dig into the fundamentals of field reverse configurations. So an FRC, and I'll be using FRC from here on out, um, an FRC is a closed magnetic topology, cylindrical geometry. What you're, see what you're seeing here is an axisymmetric cutaway of a series of cylindrical electromagnets. Um, inside that cylindrical magnetic topology, we have a closed field where all of the plasma diamagnetic current and magnetic field lines are closed, um, forming a toroidal but very long topology. A couple of fundamental relations we're going to be talking about today. The most important is beta. Um, and so this comes from, this is plasma beta, and I'm specifically talking about the average plasma beta rather than a localized plasma beta. And that, that's going to be important later. Um, the plasma beta is a ratio of the external magnetic field to the internal particle pressure of the plasma. Really, as you push on this plasma, what is the inter, how does the plasma push back? on that magnetic field. And for an FRC, this is really critical. Um, plasma beta is very close to one, usually well over 90%, sometimes 95, 98% plasma beta. What that means is that this plasma temperature, energy, and um, uh, pressure is always in balance with an external field that allows us to compress and heat the plasma as well as translate it equally, e easily. Couple other key relationships that matter. Flux comp conservation. So if you have an FRC that you create, you have an amount of trapped magnetic flux. And unless you have a technique to add new flux to that FRC, you have a local amount of FRC of trapped colloidal magnetic flux. As you increase magnetic field, you can compress that plasma and it pushes back and creates a, an equilibrium radius and scale. That's really critical. That also allows us to define a lot of the internal, um, uh, parameters of the FRC and distribution of the various particles and temperatures. Last big one is the amount of the trapped flux defines how big that compressed FRC is, and that's going to be a really critical parameter as we start talking about the thermonuclear fusion conditions and the plasma fusion, uh, the plasma physics results after compression. So before we dig into that part, I want to take a one step back at, at, at a higher level and look at how we model these systems. Um, in most fusion systems, the internal distribution of the density, so the amount of particles, the temperature, how hot those particles are, as well as the energy in the system is not very uniform. And it can be quite complex, requiring detailed uh, magnetohydrodynamic, I'm going to call that MHD, equations, as well as simulation and a whole bunch of experimentation. FRCs we have found historically to be much, much simpler 
than most fusion plasmas. So we'll talk about why and provide some theoretical scaling, computational scaling, and empirical results to back that up and use those results to dig into the fundamental thermonuclear equations for fusion and power output. So um, there's a number of models that we can, we can use for, for FRC plasmas. The simplest one is a uniform cylindrical model. It's a long cylinder. We just simply average the density and temperature over that volume and, and use that as our fundamental scaling. And we're going to get to is to show that all the more complex scalings for our type, for the, the compressed FRCs that Helion makes, can be represented very accurately with cylindrical profile, but the more advanced theoretical models for FRC plasmas come back to the very earliest days of FRC literature. And you'll see in the references quite a bit of literature around this. One of the most fundamental theoretical models for an FRC profile is called a rigid rotor profile. Rigid rotor profile is a theoretical model that's well referenced and documented and references are attached that then shows the radial profiles going through the cylinder from the, the core all the way to the edge of an FRC at high pressure and at, at high um, beta. You can see actually shown on the slide here that for an FRC, there's some really interesting profiles that we'll touch, just touch on um, in that you have a core of an FRC that's lower density. And as you go towards the edge of the FRC, density increases and peaks in what we call the null region. And then very quickly, what we call the separatrix region decreases very rapidly. Temperature, however, is much more steady. A small, slight decrease in the internal in the plasma temperature in the in the core goes through the null and then decreases in the separatrix. And we'll get into thermal conduction and talk about why. Um, one of the other keys is in the null region. There's no magnetic field. That's where the the externally applied magnetic field is fully reversed, and you have literally a magnetic field of B equals zero condition um, that has some very unique properties and allows us to simplify the models quite a bit. Rigid rotor profile, however, typically compared to uh, experimental systems that we actually build, have very large separatrix. Um, so that's the area after the null region um, that will have a very large uh, separatrix. We think of it literally as a fluffy FRC. For highly compressed and high temperature of the thermonuclear type FRCs, what we actually see is not those large boundaries, those that wide separatrix, but what we would call a sharp boundary. And there's several models, the modified Sherpa boundary, the very sharp boundary, or a, a, a very a, you know, zero, think about a, a cylindrical boundary, um, where you have very few, less than a gyro orbit of separatrix. Um, so we take those two mo those, those models and we're going to talk about those. What we can go one step further and have a full calculation. Of the, of the magnetohydrodynamic calculation of an FRC. We use a code called Cygnus uh, developed uh, with at Helion. And in the references, you'll see the work by Dan Barnes, Richard Milroy, and others on Cygnus. Um, this is a two-dimensional 2D resistive MHD code that very accurately mod models both the internal plasma dynamics of an FRC, as well as its response to an external magnetic field, and more importantly, an external circuit. Um, and then lastly, in the references, and we'll touch on all this briefly, is a, is, a, is a wide variety of work done by others in the field um, that have measured internal plasma profiles uh, and density and temperature. So taking all those models together, and that's what we did in this work, is, is you can see for some normalized representative cases, um, data on the right, data on, on the screen here, for a radial profiles, uh, in this case, on the left of, of the chart goes from the core of the FRC, so radius equals zero, all the way out to the edge where the magnetic field is. For a, a, a weakly compressed FRC uh, and a very highly compressed FRC over 10 to the 22 density. Um, and what you can see then is a, is a comparison of radial profiles, um, both internal to the core as well as the spray bulk layer and the separatrix. We took these models and then we integrated radially over the full profile, taking then integrating over just simple energy, so density and temperature, as well as more complex parameters looking at fusion reaction rates, approximated as, dense, approximated as density squared, temperature the 2.6, and radiation losses um, that go as electron temperature to the, the one half power. Integrating all of those and comparing the models, we can then look at, okay, for a given profile, that's been normalized to a, a one specific condition. What is the net energy confinement, uh, fusion power output, and radiation losses for those systems? And you can see on the screen here, what we found is that comparing a the Cygnus detailed MHD model to a simple cylindrical compression model is a very good approximation on the order of 10%, um, and even more importantly, 10 the 
the simple, simplified model tends to under report the performance um, compared to an actual experimental result. Um, <clears throat> and then more advanced models with uh, the uh, very sharp boundary, modified sharp boundary, as well as the simplified rigid rotor uh, tend to be actually increasing in amounts of error errors and start to over predict. So what we believe from this is we can very easily take a cylindrical model, we can apply that to an FRC and use that to now look at a whole, a whole host of the operational parameters of what a generator may look like. I want to want, want to point out one um, detail we haven't talked about uh, historically is, is really how are these compressed in a high beta system as you take a magnetic field and you ramp it to increasing field. Um, if the beta is close to one, what that means is that the FRC is then compressed, increasing in density and in temperature. The equations that represent that adiabatic compression are actually well understood, uh, provided here on the, the screen as well as in the references. Showing as you increase that magnetic field, the plasma pressure increases, increases in temperature, roughly temperature to the uh, in our systems to about 0.8 scale and density to the 1.2. Um, and you can you can see very quickly then that by if you can have a large magnetic compression, you can increase the temperature to very high temperatures. And what we've been able to demonstrate is in our systems, it's a wide range of operation um, all the way down to uh, compression at the 1 keV ion temperatures up to near 10 keV and then electron temperature well over 2 keV and also a wide range of densities over three orders of magnitude for our compressed systems that we did in Trenta. Um, and so that allows us to operate over wide parameter space of final fusion conditions both temperature and density. Now that we've explored the radial profiles as well as how adiabatic scaling works in a field reverse configuration, we can talk about the fundamental scaling up to generator thermonuclear fusion conditions. So what we're going to do is we take the standard um, simplified fusion relations, but add in now a cylindrical radial model for the distribution of density and temperature radially and a linear model for the density and temperature across the length of an elongated FRC. You can quite easily now explore a full parameter space of temperature, density, fusion power output, and radiation. So touching on those equations today, um, one of the most important that's unique for FRC plasmas is this beta equal one relationship. And in this, once you once you assume a beta equal one or very close to one, you can now simplify density, temperature, and directly equate it with the square of the magnetic field. Further, if you assume a fixed ion to electron temperature ratio, which we do typically see in FRCs, you can go one step further now and equate fusion power output with the, the standard cross sections. And in this case, we're using Maxwellian cross sections. Um, we're using standard Maxwellian cross sections. You can now fold that in and have a very simplified equation for what is the power output, watts per meter cubed for a thermonuclear fusion system as represented here with ion temperature, the uh, external magnetic field, the plasma beta and the ion temperature to electron temperature ratio. Um, a very unique feature here is noticing as typical that this is magnetic field to the fourth power, that's expected, but also it's beta to the squared power um, and a very strong relationship to that ion temperature uh, ratio. Filling out the rest of the equations, Brimstrahlung losses are shown here, cyclotron or synchrotron losses are shown here as, long as, as well as the absorption of those systems. The last key thing to talk about is plasma transport. Um, the energy and particle confinement of, of an FRC is very well established empirically with some theoretical scaling as well as shown in the references. What we're using today is the empirical relationships that the Helion team has developed over the years over our now six uh, fusion prototypes that equates uh, the particle transport and the energy transport of the plasma out of an FRC uh, through cross-field diffusion and other mechanisms and relates that to the scale of the FRC, the density of the FRC, and one of the most unique parameters is the geometric scaling, the uh, elongation that's, that's here represented as epsilon of that FRC. So in a simplified way, we're representing the total uh, confinement time as, as literally the ratio of one over the energy transport time and, and shown here, and we'll be using that, and you'll see that that drives a lot of the equations. So by taking all of this together, we can fold this all into a simple model and now scale the fusion power output with the input energy as well as lost radiation input, uh, lost radiation power and particle transport power 
um, and put together a series of equations looking at the power density, this is in watts per meter cubed, of an FRC plasma over a wide variety of conditions. One thing to note here is we are considering all radiation losses as losses, and we're considering all particle transport as losses. For a pulse system, that's probably not a very good assumption because we get to use that power in an actual generator to generate electricity. But for now, we're taking the conservative model and considering all that is lost. So let's start with a DT fuel by using the cross sections from a deuterium tritium reaction with a 50-50 ratio. You can put together these power output and input uh, plots. So what you see on your screen here are two conditions. You're seeing a beta, a traditional beta, and this is for most fusion, this is a pretty high beta already of 10%. Um, and then uh, what I call particle beam heating. So uh, uh, a neutral beam will heat uh, electrons primarily. And so you get an electron ion temperature ratio that is actually greater than one, where the electrons are on the order of in this model 50% hotter than the ions. Um, below in the, the following chart, what you see is the same DT fusion plasma, but now at high beta, beta, beta of 100%, beta of one. Um, and then also uh, ion and electrons now in equilibrium. We're going to talk to, we're going to talk about more advanced systems in, in a second. Um, however, in a high beta system, uh, the results here are really what you'd expect. Um, for a low beta system with an FRC transport, an FRC transport is typically um, significantly better than a, a historical theta pinch, but less than a large closed field tokamak or, or other system. Um, but with our traditional transport, you have a system that at low beta struggles to, to, to work and struggles to, to ignite or or um, generate electricity, where you can see here that radiation losses are not a big deal uh, in an FRC system above a few keV. However, the particle transport tends to drive uh, the power loss in these systems. Um, however, if you do, as we do in an FRC, increase beta to one in this model, what you see is actually very easily, this system closes in DT. You can get to very high Q, Q greater than 10. You can get to an ignition in a system as well. Optimal temperatures are on, on the order of 10 keV ion temperatures. Um, and this is dominated now at low temperatures by Bremsterlung radiation um, and at high temperatures by particle loss from the FRC. Kind of unique one thing to point out here for a high beta system is there is an optimal temp maximum temperature as well. Um, and that as you go up in temperature in a model like this, you're correspondingly for fixed beta going down in density. So density is increasing. And even though for a while with the fusion cross section is dominated by going up in ion temperature, eventually you get to a point where that intensity squared fall off in the fusion power output because, because you're actually going down in density as you go up in temperature, that starts to actually hamper your fusion power output. And you end up with an optimum in DT, the maximum power output is on the 10 to 20 keV. Um, but as losses increase, you may have an optimum that's below that maximum uh, power output and well below the maximum cross section. So that's an important parameter for high beta plasmas that I think is, is worth pointing out several times. Um, DT, again, um, Q greater than 10 uh, should be possible as well as full ignition in that system. But this allows us to go on to more advanced fuels. And this is where, from my point of view at Helion, it gets much more interesting. Um, there's obvious engineering advantages to being operate in a low neutron or a neutronic fuel, uh, as well as uh, gas input parameters, commercial benefits, and a whole host of things that we're not going to cover today. Um, we're, but we are going to look at the theoretical results for a deuterium and helium-3 fusion plasma. I've also included in this model the deuterium-deuterium fusion for deuterium helium-3, that the actual fusion uh, energy output from that may be significant. Um, so that is in the model here. So what you're seeing on the slide is you're seeing two plots similar to before of a deuterium helium-3 plasma now using at low beta with a, a poor ion to electron temperature ratio. Below that is the high beta version of this where we've increased plasma beta, but we've still kept an equilibrium ion to electron temperature. And then you'll also see in the following slide now you take that and you go with what we see and what we've modeled and others have seen uh, empirically in many devices now is that we actually have much hotter ions than electrons, pushing those radiation losses even further lower. And here's what the results look like. In a low beta condition, deuterium helium-3 really doesn't make sense. Uh, for FRCs, probably other systems, even with better confinement, they're dominated by both plasma transport losses as well as radiation losses, somewhat surprisingly, are a driver and that fusion power output for D-helium-3 does not close. Um, however, by going up in beta, what you effectively do is turn up the fusion power output by being able to increase the density for any 
uh, uh, for a fixed magnetic field and for a fixed radiation loss. That allows you now to finally get to a condition where DLAM3 not only starts to make sense, but it starts to make a lot of sense. In this case, for an equilibrium plasma where ion and electron temperatures are still equal, so this is maybe a, in a steady operating case, which is not what helion is doing, but in a steady operating case, you now get to a condition where you can get to break even in deuterium helium-3. You can produce more energy out than you put in or that you're losing from either radiation or particle transport. That optimal temperature is surprisingly low. In um, traditional literature for helium-3, we talk about 50 keV, 70 keV, well over 100 keV optimal ion temperatures. But what we found for, what we find for high beta is that in fact, that the penalty of going up in temperature and lowering in density comes back to your fusion power output. And your goal then is to now optimize power output, which optimizes in the 20 to 30 keV territory, maybe as high as 50 in some cases, but never all the way up to those very high temperatures. So what we see is that in equilibrium, now we can break even. And further, if you can get into a non-equilibrium plasma, which is what we see empirically, now the situation changes even further. Radiation losses are suppressed. Uh, and, and even assuming you lose all of the output particle energy and output radiation, you still have a, a situation where you can get to much higher than one Q. We actually see a scientific Q of greater than five possible. And you can get right to the border where maybe even ignition is possible. What I'm saying here at Helion right now is that that's not our focus to get to ignition. And in fact, the fact that we don't have to really helps uh, in terms of commercial aspects. But you get right to the border now of where ignition even in Helium-3 is possible if you can get to high beta and you can suppress radiation losses. The last really key thing to see here is not only is the optimal temperature less than 100 keV, but in fact, break even in helium-3 starts to be possible over 10 keV. And that's a really exciting result that we think opens up the, uh, the parameter space for how you would operate a thermonuclear fusion generator in the future. Today, we went over the fundamental relationships in a field reverse configuration. Uh, describable equilibrium as well as adiabatic compression. We we're able to do a deep dive into radial profiles for the first time, just describing and comparing both advanced theoretical models, the full MHD magnetohydrodynamic simulations with some empirical results as well, and show that in fact the cylindrical topology and a cylindrical, a simple cylindrical model is probably is a very good model and is a conservative model for the internal profile of an FRC. We're able to fold those into the full thermonuclear fusion equations and explore a host of density and temperature ranges of an operating fusion system. Some of the key results that we presented today is that a high beta DT fusion system with an FRC um, does close and would work in a generator system. But much more exciting is that a deuterium helium-3 fusion system, if you can get the high beta, particularly and suppress radiation losses with hot ions and colder electrons, can get to not only net gain, but, but practical commercial power output levels.